First, my thanks to Troll for sharing her work today and for sharing her thoughts. Um, as in the case of last year's works, Faculty Works in Progress, we'll keep the introductions pretty short because you probably know the people already. So I was trying to think of things you might not know about Toral um, that I know. Uh, <laughs> so Toral Moore is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Literature, and you might not all know this, is a member of many departments. Um, literature, English, Philosophy, and Romance Studies at the least. I thought there were five, but I may have... Theater, Theater Studies. Theater Studies, okay. Yeah, I missed that. And she's also the director uh, for the Center for Philosophy, Art, and Literature, the PAL program. And as Toral notes in her web biography, she has three broad areas of interest, feminist theory and women's writing, the intersection of literature, philosophy, and aesthetics, and third, ordinary language philosophy in the tradition of Wittgenstein, Cabell, and Austin. And her books include sexual slash textual politics, um, second one, Simone de Beauvoir, The Making of an Intellectual Woman, third one, What is a Woman and Other Essays, fourth, Henrik Ibsen and the Birth of Modernism, and most recently, Revolution of the Ordinary, which has a subtitle, Literary Studies after Wittgenstein, Austin, and Cavell. And though those monograph titles all fit comfortably within um, academic and an academic bookshelf and were published by prestigious presses, which is Oxford UP and University of Chicago Press, it's worth stressing that I think all of these books have been very well received both within and outside the academy. Um, that is, Toral's books have broad readerships, which is not an easy thing to do for academics. Um, I think this is in part because, as is evident from the reading for today, Toral writes explicitly for broader audiences. She writes for academic audiences, but also things that are directly positioned for positioned at broader audiences, which we can maybe characterize as intellectual, but not narrowly academic audiences. So she writes a regular column for a Norwegian cultural newspaper, and then also publishes reviews frequently in periodicals such as the London Review of Books. And so we'll, we're talking about one of the, are they, we've read one of those, and that's the occasion for having a discussion about writing more generally. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I am so delighted to be here at an event where there are real people in the room. I also know that we have our Zoom uh, participants, and we hope that Zoom participants will be able to ask questions. Um, Quante will be able to guide us through all this, I believe. So, um, I suppose we have an hour 15, isn't that what we do? So I assume you have read the piece and the, this is the book I was sent to review. And I will tell you a little bit about what I think about writing for a more specifically wider audience, like in the London Review of Books or the Point Magazine or uh, public books and those kinds of venues that are definitely trying to be intellectual and see themselves as writing for very intelligent and broadly educated people. The only, the, the only difference is you're not writing for people who actually have just read the same books as you or are just in the same field. So that's the only difference in audience, but it makes a big difference. So this, I understand that the theme for this fall is, I mean, we're going to focus in these workshops on writing to different audiences. And mine is then for this kind of wider audience. So I have a few points that I'll just say, but I hope that, but those are sort of meta points mostly. And then I hope we can discuss them on day as well, if we get that far. The, the major difference, for me at least, is not one of writing style, the difference between an academic publication and this sort of thing. It's not, certainly not, a matter of deliberately simplifying something that really is more difficult. I absolutely detest the word popularization. I don't think it belongs in the humanities. I can imagine if you're in some in mathematics or physics that it has a place but for us surely the, the the trick is to pick the truly interesting things about your research and think about them carefully and clearly and then it's all in 
how you produce your sentences. Um, the thinking that went into my very piece was as good as I could make it. I really thought as hard as I possibly could. Uh, it was just as difficult to me to figure out where I stood in relation to base work and in relation to the book I was sent to review as to write, as I'm doing in my current academic work in progress on Wittgenstein's aspect seeing, for example, which is really hard to get clear on. But it's not harder, it's just some different questions. Different questions means you go about answering them differently. Uh, so, but there's no difference in thinking and working your way through the material. But the major difference, as I have experienced it in the LRB or the point or wherever, is that nobody in such publications want to know how your ideas fit in with previous scholarship. You really don't have to give an account of previous scholarship has said X, and here's where I come in. This is like something that we're always told to do when we publish an academic piece, and I believe in doing that. It's just that for these venues, they couldn't care less. They don't want to know the nitpicking details of past scholarship. They want to know what matters to, to us now about the subject. Um, and they don't even care deeply. If I happen to write something that even from a scholarly point of view is original about they, that's good. But that's not the point. The point is to say something that makes readers sit up and think, ah, I really ought to get into that. Or this really is a challenging text. Or maybe we should boycott they. It doesn't really matter what your argument is. It's like you want your readers to become interested and have a position in relation to it. So. Um, of course, sometimes you actually are a scholar on what you're writing about. Quite a few years ago, I wrote an essay on the new translation of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex for the LRB. And I am a Beauvoir scholar, so there I knew everything. It made it 10 times as hard to write. <laughs> it was just so difficult. And um, this last year, I've written on Nathalie Sarot and on Simone Weil for them. And I have never published anything academic about either. So academia requires scholarship. And that means knowing what people have said about your topic before you and being clear on what you add to the conversation. And that's what we call originality. But in the LRB, when I say LRB here, they're just a placeholder for this kind of venue. Um, they also want you to be original. They would like you to think freely and widely about your subject. But they don't want any footnotes. And they want the originality to come across in your writing and in your ideas. They want you to make the reader sit up and take notice and to go on to consider the subject for themselves. Um, in my opinion, I have, one good thing about this is that it makes me write, or I think it could make anyone write with a greater positivity, because this accounting for what people have said, you can often get into in academia some nitpicking negativity because you're so worried that you won't sound like your original. So you have to say everyone else gets it wrong. And here's where I get it right. And we all feel possibly a bit awkward about that because we're not, it's not really why we're into our subject. So in a way, the, this teaches me that there are different ways of making the point, even in scholarship, that you can say, here's my contribution without necessarily be so nitpicking and negative about your predecessors. So that's one good thing. And then um, the other thing is that journals like the LRB need you to tell a story about your subject. 
in, in my view, we actually do that in academia too. It's just that academics aren't always totally self-conscious about it or conscious about it. Every academic piece also has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that is Aristotle's definition of a plot. We guide the reader from some premise through an argument to a conclusion. Ideally, we do this so well that the reader wants to follow along and say, oh, yes, now I see, mm -hmm. this is good. That's the ideal response, of course. Um, so that, so I, I feel that this teaches me to construct my pieces in a more, should we say, well, in a more readable way so that I can get my readers to follow me. And that's something that I think uh, academics should do too. And of course, many do, but academics aren't still not trained, even in the humanities, to think of writing as a craft that you need to learn. But I'm all in favor of that, as the students in writing is thinking, my writing is thinking class know. So then we have a huge difference in the process, the editors. The editors play a massive role in these venues. In academia, we have external readers, referees, and the like. And they are often quite nitpicking and go on about their detailed scholarly concerns. But in the LRB and that kind of journal, the editors take a very active hand in the process. In my case, for example, I originally wrote a piece which contained a lot more discussion of this book than what is in the, what is in the final version. But the editors had two concerns. First of all, the length of the piece, that's, uh, you just have to cut until you get to wherever they want you to be. And then second, the fact that the more detailed discussions of Zaretsky's book simply weren't as exciting and interesting as the rest of the material in their opinion. And so they much preferred my own discussion of race, life and ideas and really wanted me to cut most of the Zaretsky discussions, which was a pity because I really spent so long going through this in detail. But then this had some strengths and some weaknesses because I agreed to make most of those cuts with a tiny few exceptions because I too could see that the temperature of the prose fell in those bits. After publication, however, as you will have seen, the author wrote a letter to the LRB in which he complained that I had spent too little time on his book. And also that I'm simply wrong in what I say about his views and ideals on ideals and idealism. Now, that's when I realized that I had agreed to cut too much because between the second to last, and the last paragraph, or was it the third and second to last paragraph in the piece you have, I had a paragraph setting up with exact quotes of what he thinks about the ideals. And he quotes the philosopher Todd May, who's uh, against having high ideals, for example. And but so now I realize I should have kept that one paragraph since I really, it really supported my claims at the end of the, the, the piece. But I am, it's not the editors who are responsible for the final version. Your name goes on it. So I'm responsible for that. And I agreed with cutting that. So then I feel I really, I, I never wrote a response to the author because I feel it's on me. It's the way it looks. And he can say that, and I could have written back and say, oh no, but that's not, look at page so-and-so. But again, I let that go. Editors are obsessed with language. Editors will, if they're any good, edit every one of your sentences. They will rewrite phrases. For example, I wrote Death's Head about the Nazis' uniform or the SS uniforms, and they preferred Tortenkopf for reasons that, I mean, not quite sure I fully understand that, but I don't see why I should quarrel with an editor on an issue like that. 
in most cases, their suggestions are improvements. And in, as with all editing, you find a third solution in other cases which you like better. And I found that it's like a privilege, a precious and wonderful experience to find that someone takes your words seriously enough to wonder whether you really mean to use that word, shape your sentence like this, end on that point, um, or whether you really have the right shape of that paragraph and so on. I have learned so much about writing from working with editors in Mornblad in Norway, the point and the LRB. And everything I've learned from writing for such venues is applicable in my academic writing too. There's really, the, it really works extremely well there too. I really wish that academics would get more feedback on their writing, see when we end up in these interminably long sentences where it's not clear where the verb is and all these things, because ideas would shine through better if we cared more about that. I am, of course, not saying that no academic cares about it or that all academics write clunky sentences, but we are never explicitly in enjoined in our training to say this is crucial. It's rare that people give you feedback on your writing when you hand in a paper. Of course it happens, but it's not like you can't get your BA in English unless you've taken a writing course or something. Um, so for me, of course, writing is thinking. To work on writing improves the thinking when I pay attention to my sentences, I can begin to see what I'm saying. And then I rewrite until I feel I can mean what I actually say. It's not like first I have the thought and then I put it on paper. It's like you struggle to get something on paper. And then you look at it and you think, oh my God, that can't possibly stand. I don't want to say that. And that's how you keep going. So when it comes to bank. I'm so glad I accepted the invitation to write this piece. But why did I accept it? First, I hesitated. I'm not, after all, a Vey scholar. In fact, I, had, I hadn't read much Vey at all when I began. I'd read a few essays and Simone Petremont's very long and thorough biography. It's a fantastic biography, it's like 800 pages or something. But I am a scholar of French mid-century literature and intellectual life. That's why I'd read the biography. And um, Beauvoir and Sartre, who are various contemporaries, have always accompanied my writing and thinking. And then I've always felt that I really would like to know more about they. And this here was an opportunity. And that's like different. You don't subject, submit uh, an article to a scholarly journal on the grounds that you'd like to know more about it. <laughs> you sort of have to have the scholarship first. So um, in some ways, this position put me in an ideal situation to write for the LRB. Because I'm knowledgeable about the period and the society, I know quite a bit about the people and institutions that shaped by. And But I'm no expert on her, which means that if I think something is interesting and new, there's a big chance that my non-expert readers might think so too. And that's the risk you take. You just have to go for it and say, this strikes me. Here's something. And hope that you hit the right tone. If you're actually deeply into the scholarship, that's harder to do because you think as a deep expert and find it fascinating to discuss exactly where Simone de Beauvoir spent three days in August 1945 or something. Um, was she depressed? Was she not? And there's a scholarship on that. And then before you know it, you've written two pages on a dying meeting. So <laughs> that's the problem with uh, knowing almost too much. So. I accepted the invitation because it was a chance to expand my horizons. And I like the effort of writing for these venues. So then the work began. I got two dozen books out of the library. I read a ton of eyes, a lot of books, a snippet of books on her. 
luckily I didn't have to write down all the bibliographical information because no one's going to ask me about it anyway. <laughs> and then I started to write. Now I had learned from past efforts that this kind of journal wants you to sketch the biography of your subject, whether or not it's relevant. It's like impossible not to. When I reviewed the translation of uh, The Second Sex, they sent it back to me immediately and said, tell us a lot about her life first. But <laughs> you just had to do it. But in this case, my luck was to see very early on that race in, they, in the case of Simone Weiss specifically, her person is so intertwined with her thinking, both in her own life, but also in the way readers have responded to her. Her life stands as a kind of guarantor for her sincerity in her writing in ways that's quite unusual. So here I felt it was almost an organic part of the writing. Um, so the challenge <clears throat> was then to write about her life in a way that at once gave space to my own responses to aspects of her life and shaped the text so as to naturally feed into a discussion of the ideas that I thought were interesting. And of course, that took a lot of time. The hard thing here is because you don't have the book length to work in. The really hard thing is to pick the salient details, the fact that you can't skip and skip everything else. The art of cutting, because of course I wrote much more and then it had to be cut out again because otherwise there would be a special issue of the LRB and Simone Weil wasn't on the cards. So, <laughs> um, so then the question, I'm almost done now, but there's a couple of questions that often come up in academia, which is, should this kind of writing count for tenure and promotion? And my answer is, I'm probably very old fashioned, but my answer is, it depends. I do think that academia should be about scholarship. That's what we are. We don't train each other to continue the scholarly traditions. I don't see who will do it. So I think an academic should be a scholar, meaning knowing the debates, having done serious research and so on of something. But we should also ideally be wide ranging intellectuals. And we should be able to communicate with people who aren't academics. And so my view is that someone who say only writes this kind of pieces and nothing that you would recognize as a scholarly book or something, I would not call that person exactly an academic. I would call them a nonfiction writer. And I think that's great, but I'm not sure that that's the same thing as what we require for tenure in academia. I'm not talking about writing programs. If you're hired to be a nonfiction writer, then that's what you're doing, of course. So uh, an academic for me should definitely have to prove that she can do serious scholarship. But then I think an academic who has proved that and keeps proving it should also absolutely get credit for doing this sort of thing as well. It shouldn't, um, I think that we still haven't sort of quite figured out what do we do with a good article in the LRB, for example, this one, as opposed to a peer reviewed, boringly written, I'm just playing it up here, in some obscure academic peer reviewed journal. Is it clear that the second is always like, supposed to count more than the former? I'm not sure about that. But I do think that there's got to be some scholarship in that dossier, for sure. So, um, and we have some work to do in academia to figure out how to give the right sort of credit for, because it's also very easy to dash off a column of two pages and call that public scholarship, which it may well be. But there's, there's huge differences between the work that goes into this piece and a lot of shorter pieces that you can do much faster. All these debates I have no solution to, but I do think that we need to have academics writing in those forms too. And the key thing was, I am 
I am so convinced that the fact that I've been lucky enough to write for many years for various non-academic venues has truly improved my academic writing. I write better even when I write about Wittgenstein than I would have done otherwise. And it's taught me about language in ways I'm eternally grateful for. And then final point, feedback. So after doing all this, and it took me eons of time, I was gratified with the outcome. I received a ton of positive feedback. And here's the point. You can publish what you consider even in your secret heart to be a major academic book. It took you 10 years to write. And how much feedback do you get? A few scholarly reviews three years later or something. <laughs> it's true that I have gotten quite a lot and a lot of what I've written, but it has taken time. And it's not like you're snowed under with ecstatic emails or something. <laughs> and then, um, then when you publish something in the LRB, you get a ton of feedback really fast. And of course, you have to strengthen yourself because a lot of it is on Twitter. <laughs> and, so of course, I'm on Twitter. But uh, it's you also get thoughtful emails, people, and mostly the kind of Twitter I do is very academic. So I've t so far, I haven't received any horrible responses. But the thing is, there's something gratifying to, with this kind of writing to see, discover that you actually have readers immediately. And that's really just good. It feels different from that feeling that you may be this lonely academic voice shouting in the desert and did anyone notice this book and so on. So at that, I've covered some of my points. And I hope that you all want to discuss the actual piece with me. Thank you. I can call on people. I'll just wait for you all. I think I know a lot of you, but I have to say with masks, I'm not sure I'm up to names in every case. So, and of course, Quante, how do we do it if someone on... on uh, so, for those of you who are online, if you are use the raise hand function, and once you raise your hand and you've been called on, then you can unmute your mic and speak. Okay, so will you keep an eye, because you can see that yes. screen better than I can. So anyone in this room who wants to discuss something? <clears throat> Why do you think the LRB editors chose to give this book coverage? Uh, what was it about this book? Or, uh, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, editors do have a lot of leeway in that the editor I've been working with has consistently sent me stuff that has to do with French mid-century intellectuals. And I think she took a great interest in that field. And how they think Simone Weil rather than someone else, I really don't know. But I do know that con I always assume that if an editor contacts you as opposed to you pitching a, a project to them, it's because they think there's something in the current moment that is possibly going on here. And I found that... I just try to read Ray to see what strikes me as a human being concerned about the world and so on today in Ray. And I was, as you can see, really both touched and impressed by her, finding some of her stuff utterly unbelievable, some so inspiring. And I think from what I gather from the feedback, that's exactly what hit the nerve. So I assume that an editor has this Punch that, oh, maybe it's time to discuss Ray now. And then they hope the reviewer will tell them why it's time. But you, you, and you, so you just try it. That's my best effort there. So that, that was a, a great question that hadn't occurred to me. But I mean, I wonder if it's a, it's a University of Chicago press book, I guess. But it sounds like a 
somewhat popular book um, in the sense that you know you have this life in five ideas. I think you know, we have a number under I don't know, 10 or something like that. Or that sounds, <laughs> yes. sounds popular. And so, I mean, I'm wondering, because of course it's great to get your book reviewed in something like this, as opposed to only the, the field periodical. I'm not sure if this improves sales or not, but um, <laughs> but in general, that's the kind of coverage we would love to get your book reviewed here, not just to be the reviewer, but, but I'm wondering if they thought of this as a book that potentially a much broader audience. I think that's probably true. It's rare that the LRB reviews an incredibly scholarly tome. It's not unheard of. It does depend on that they have reviewed Piketty, for example, but you can see why it has a very scholarly but massive contemporary implications. And so, uh, yeah, I think that they saw that this book is probably what Chicago considers a bit of a crossover book. It's written by an academic, but it definitely is trying to reach a wider audience. So that's probably one reason why they picked this book. I certainly had nothing to do with it. I have a little bit of a more technical question. And Toral, one of the things that I always love about your writing is the way that you're able to weave in your own impressions in these beautiful ways. And I know that's something that you've encouraged me to do, especially in these more popular pieces. And I'm thinking about how beautiful this paragraph is that begins, I am struck by her loneliness. Um, and I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit more about how you weave in your impressions in this way that still manages to be scholarly while also kind of touching on that human aspect that you had talked about, because I think it's part of what makes your writing so amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, you picked the one paragraph that I would have picked if I were to say my best paragraph. <laughs> it's that one, <laughs> the one that began, I'm struck by her loneliness. She wanted to merge with the masses, to be anonymous and un unobtrusive, a worker, a farmhand, a trade unionist, a soldier, one among many, working and fighting alongside others. Yet she found true solidarity hard to come by. Everywhere she went, she stood out. She was often the only woman. She was always different. Tortel notes that her purity inspired fear. Even her writings are not really about acknowledging the pain of others. They are rather about the complete eradication of the self in the service of the afflicted, who, precisely because of their affliction, have already had their own subjectivity obliterated. There is only loving interlocutor is God. Now that I read it out because I somehow think that maybe not everyone had memorized it, <laughs> but you can see how it builds from acknowledging where I stand in the life. I've read and read and read, and this strikes me. There's no close friend, never a lover, of course. No, it, it's it's the parents, but and I'm thinking. That is so striking. And then building on that, and all I do here in terms of my personal response is to say I'm struck by her loneliness. I don't go on about myself after that, but I build on that to say, hey, let me look a little on how she writes about self and other, because I've worked a lot on theories of the other, and particularly Simone de Beauvoir, when you've got Levinas, and you've got all these people thinking about otherness. And then I realized, and this for me is exactly where one of the best and most original intellectual ideas came. It was when I trusted my intuition that she's so lonely. And then I asked, well, how does she write about others? And I realized, well, there are no others there because the subjectivity is destroyed in affliction. And that's what's so powerful when she writes about affliction. But it's also therefore not an ethics that can tell you about really dealing with others. <laughs> so to me, that was, I think what, so how do you do it? Well, you, Trust your intuition and write it down. And then you see if there's something in the text and in your knowledge that can build on that. It's a, and sometimes you try and it doesn't work, so you cut it. But I do think that also the way I see work in the humanities 
is that what we do is always work, and I see that's all, all scientific work too, but whatever we do is work done by a specific human subject. We write as the human beings we are, and there's something wrong about pretending that you're not a person writing. That is, I'm all in favor of people using impersonal styles if that's what they like, as long as they don't also fall for the conclusion that therefore what I'm saying is 100% objective and sort of truer than if someone uses the words I or me. So uh, th that's just my view. It's I'm the reader. It's my take away that's coming out here, not some kind of impersonal God-given truth. But then that's the nearest we come to truth in the humanities. There's no other way of doing it. So that's why I'm, I find it quite natural to say I'm struck by. There's philosophy underneath to do that. Did you know that when you started that McCarthy had uh, translated a piece? Oh yeah, I knew that from you way knew back. That. Yes. All right. So, so can you tell me a little more about the about the transatlanticness or trans translinguisticness of 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 the moment that that McCarthy found herself in? Well, you see, I did spend a lot of time reading up on Mary McCarthy and my sort of going through the great women intellectuals of the mid-century. Obviously, then the one I should write about next, but don't make me do this, is Hannah Arlen, to a big hole in whatever I've ever written on. <laughs> but, um, and McCarthy, actually, because I read a ton on her, but found, well, the scholar in me tells me I'm not an Americanist. And they have so many specific debates that wouldn't have been what I was interested in. Yeah. Now I could write on McCarthy, I think. But, but so Mary McCarthy, she was just, her French was beautiful and she translated this piece, L'Iliade ou le Poème de la Force, very soon after World War II. They wrote it during just the, during the phony war in 39, 40, before the Germans invaded Paris, but she was writing it then, reading the Iliad, well, I think she continued working on it as they were fleeing Paris and ending up in Marseille, so 1940s. And McCarthy in 1945, I don't have the reference right in front of me, but it was published in English in 45, should we say, and I think it was in the journal Politics. Well, McCarthy also translated um, a piece by Simone de Beauvoir, namely An Eye pour an Eye. That's how I got into this. An Eye for an Eye, which was about the trial and execution of Robert Brasillac, the fascist writer who was the only writer who was executed as a, for treason after the liberation. And Beauvoir attended the trial and wrote about it. And McCarthy translated that too beautifully. She's a fantastic translator of French. So I think at that point, McCarthy had written some books, but she was very involved with the New York intellectuals and did all kinds of peace work for politics and partisan review and all that. And that's how it came about. And she wasn't then what she became later, like a sort of holy or domineering figure or something. Mm -hmm. Well, that is, of course, so oh, the second to last paragraph is the one as I reach the end of the subversive Simone Ray. And after that, let's see, I printed out, I had a whole long paragraph. This one, which was cut. Oh, oh. someone had written on this chat, but it was hard to do the Oh, I see. The question is uh, second to last paragraph. Um, 
why would I say that? It's, it's, it's essentially why am I saying what I'm saying in the second to last paragraph? Would that be too short? No, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so because you were then saying, I'm saying that I feel that there was a kind of fundamental conundrum about Zaretsky's book, which was, for me, he's obviously writing the book because he wants more people to take up Ray and learn from her in today's society. That's why the LRB wanted to be uh, reviewed, I suspect. But then as he goes on, the book, I had lots of examples. The book is actually quite full of tiny nitpicking cri criticisms here and there. And then at the end, uh, he turns around and I will, actually the best thing I can say is that I can now read the so-called cut <laughs> paragraph, which you see what you have, I, I, continued after the, the question you quote, I, I will read it like this. The subversive Simon Weil is a bit of a conundrum. Why would anyone turn to Simon Weil in search of a livable secular morality? And now comes the bit that I agreed to cut, which I should not have agreed to cut, but as I say, it's on me. At the very um, end of the book, Zaretsky reveals that his preferred moral philosopher is not Weil, but Todd May, author of A Decent Life, Morality for the Rest of Us, published 2020, a book Zaretsky praises for making, quote, a compelling case for a moral life situated between mediocrity and extremity, unquote. The problem with ideals, quote, Zaretsky concludes, is that they are, and I'm quoting here, is that they are, well, ideals. They are, by definition, impossible to live up to for nearly all of us, is unquote. Luckily, this is not a problem, for May has convinced him that, quote, if we could somehow live up to them, our lives would be less fulfilling and meaningful. I, I rest my case for saying he doesn't want ideals, but anyway. I can't imagine May agreeing with this for one second. Zaretsky, for his part, goes even further. He argues with May that struggling to live up to moral ideals is a bad thing, for it, quote, requires a great deal of sacrifice and focus, well, yes, um, and often turns us away from, quote, our most important commitment. This is sort of true, but it all depends on what we consider our most important commitment. Zaretsky doesn't say, but if it is, for example, love of family, then Ray should have stayed with her parents instead of causing them so much sorrow and herself so much pain and suffering. In this way, Zaretsky's final rejection of moral ideals amounts to a pretty wholesale dismissal both of Ray's life and her values. So I should not have cut that, should I? But uh, you can say that... It, it, I'm not sure Zaretsky would have liked it better had I kept it in. <laughs> so I don't know. But uh, you don't write for the author. If you think you're doing that, that's why you can't review things if you know the author too well or have, because, yeah, it, it will slant your judgment. So yeah, I, does that to answer your question? Yeah, that's uh, it's more about Zaretsky. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially he wants us to be inspired by various moral demands, but he doesn't want ideals and extreme moral demands. And on my reading of Ray, that's what she's all about. And if we can't get something out of that, even if, as I know, personally, I could never live up to her lofty standards, but we can learn something. And I think I've shown quite a bit about what I got out of her. Yeah. I was by this idea of responsibility trying to publish something that's not of your name and trying to practice the product of work with editors. And you, you said you were, you were generally um, very grateful for the feedback offered by editors and you often go with their suggestions. Mm -hmm. and you're, you're 
but in this situation, you know, you know, in a, in a non uncomfortable place, given that the author is, is completely new, feels misrepresented, and in some ways, they say, well, yes, I shouldn't have said this. So, can you say more about the responsibility of publishing? And also, did you have you had situations where you found it harder to work with certain editors because they just didn't get you or they didn't get the sensibility of the piece you're trying to publish? Or Right. Well, actually, first of all, I have to take responsibility for agreeing to cut it. They proposed it and I agreed, which was a mistake. It just was a mistake. At least I should have kept some of it. So because here, the reasons why I was saying something had disappeared and, and I shouldn't have gone along with that. But um, what it teaches you is that you have to write this your own person, as it were. You have to stand up for what you think is really important in your piece. But that's very hard because in some way you think your oh, every word is gold. But, uh, <laughs> but of course it's not. And of course that you, it, it's hard. And here I think I just got it wrong. So that's the, but then the final piece is published under my name. So I will live with Zaretsky saying you didn't argue that point because actually in the text, it's not there. So. Um, then um, the other thing is, have I had, I would say that in some ways, my most difficult editorial experiences have been with academic readers who sometimes have, I've had possibly because I tend to work on non-mainstream theoretical lines of thinking but i've had academic like two readers report on a piece where it was totally clear to me that neither reader had any clue what i was saying and i didn't quite know what to do with it and then there are ways of solving that. You write back to the editor and you say, oh, I've fixed all these things. They are not actually the things the readers mentioned because you don't understand that, but you make a list of all the great things you fixed. And then you say, I hope it now satisfies all your demands. And then usually they say yes. So, <laughs> but the thing is with actual, I've been lucky. I've, I've had some excellent uh, editors. And I do think my Norwegian editor, who really trained me into this many years back, she told me that she finds that it's often totally new writers, writers like young academics or, or even grad students or so, who write their first pieces for her. They can be incredibly strident about not changing anything. And she says, they should know, Toral Moy changes everything. <laughs> it's like, why, why not? And so there's something about, I think what this is about is having a professional relationship to your writing. Don't see it as an emanation of your soul exactly. Of course, it comes from your soul if it's authentic. There you have that I am struck by. But, <laughs> You have to see that sentences are craftsman-like things that a good editor can probably point to, hey, not sure about that, and so on. And then as you learn, you know, at some point, I hope I will get it just right about accepting this and not accepting that, but it's a work in progress. It's how it goes. I don't know what, but, but I've been very lucky. I have not had a kind of editor who has invited me to write something and then clearly hates every word, but I hear it happens. And so I, I don't know what you do then. I think you either persevere, and if it turns out to be impossible, you would have to gracefully back out. I think it also matters if it's an editor you work, you want to work with more, is it an editor you who's just you probably never come across them again in your life that at least do you want to build a relationship or not i mean all these things are uh, just very hard to have a general line on yeah um the the question i have is whether or not you also review books for academic journals and the reason i ask this is in part because it 
my own sense, and this may just be my field, is I, um, or I just don't get the point of reviews of academic books in my field because they basically are never longer than a thousand words. They're usually <laughs> 500 to 750 words, which mm. is basically enough to describe the book and then say at the end, some good things are and a couple bad things are. And, so true. and it's, it's not clear. And since they generally come out of the tenure books, they come out three or four years after the book has come out. They actually don't contribute to the tenure one way or the other. Oh, yeah. um, whereas this, you know, this is a little much longer. I don't know if this is the 5,000 It's 4,500 or something. Okay. If you look it up in the, in, in, online, they say how many words there are. It's under 5,000 yeah. for sure. But it's know. much greater than 750 or 1,000. Yeah. And its purpose is clear also because basically, if I'm reading this, I, I mean, I hope to learn something more about the movie, but also I'm trying to figure out, do I want to buy this book? Do I think this book is worth my time? So its purpose is clear. <laughs> Um, it's also, you know, harder in some, some ways because what you're saying is, you know, I just don't think it's the right, in a way you're saying, I don't think it's a good book. I don't think, you may, may, may put a lot of work into it, but I don't think you should buy it. I think it's... it's so particularly, in, uh, certainly in American academia, I used to write book reviews in academic things, the thousand words and all that. And it's a long time ago for, I couldn't agree more with you. It seems like if you have these general book reviews, very often what they want is a quick description of the book and with some platitudes at the end. And the reason they want that is more like, I can quickly see if this is in my field. And then they assume that scholarship means that then I would have to look at it. But you, and for example, academic reviews never talk about the writing style. I had a whole paragraph about Zaretsky's writing style. I cut that, that's okay, it was a bit tacky. And so, uh, <laughs> I, it's okay, I don't have to do that in print, but I have issues with some of the style here. But in academia, it's like, if you really put your heart and soul into writing every sentence, then those reviews are almost, I don't quite know what to say about them. I also find that people get so tied up in knots about, oh, this is a young scholar, I must be kind. And I cannot possibly say something negative about someone who's not tenured yet and so on. And that, that doesn't, or, you're the reviewer and you're still a grad student and this is the senior person in your field so you can't possibly say anything critical and as a result that whole game often strikes me as really i don't know what to say about it but i usually don't do that now um and i it's just then I think the one way to get some serious discussion of a book you write is to, if no one else does it for you, organize an online symposium, get people to write something serious as a debate about it. It may not get tons of readers, but at least you will get a sense of how people take this. So I don't know, can we reform academic review? I have no idea. Why is it like that? Talked earlier about um, you know just clarifying your idea was a good exercise for its own sake. Um, I guess I'm curious if, if writing for popular audiences has ever influenced your own scholarship or the two forms ever you know not cross pollinated, but you you looked at the subject with new eyes or with the new scope. Definitely. I mean, for example, writing this piece, to me, the valuable insight about race, bizarre absence of a concept of otherness, which we looked at, is very valuable because I might well revisit the question of the other at some point. But above all, it's the... <laughs> The way this kind of writing is to me totally central in a way is that it makes me more honest about my academic writing. I don't see why there should be, like once you have struggled this hard with your sentences, I'm not going to write my piece on Wittgenstein with sloppy sentences, like, oh, academia, that's ugly sentences. Uh, that's, that would be absurd. So it's more like how you think about writing in general, it permeates everything, and, and in a good way, I think. Oh, yeah, I have a question about the 
We had Sharon Marcus, the founding editor from Public Books here, and some of you were at her seminar. She ran a workshop for us on how to pitch to public books. And I would say, if you want to write yourself up and into this way, you should pitch to public books or the point. So I have had students and students I know in other places who might push to the point, and they've had great feedback on their writing. So you can pitch, and you can pitch at the journal that is not necessarily the LRB, because it's, I think they know what they want. But I did, in a way, pitch the review of this new Beauvoir translation to them way back, because I don't know how it was, but I, I got in touch with them and said, hey, I hear, it's not out yet, but there's a new Beauvoir translation coming out. And this is going to be a cultural event and has to be reviewed by the LRB. And then I had coffee with an editor and the now retired general editor. That was like 18 months before. And then I sort of, I'm not sure whether they would have asked me if, I mean, there are enough traces around now of my writing that anyone can look it up and see that I can write a sentence, because that's important. Like, if you publish some major thing that people think it's so convoluted, I'm not sure she could do our format, I think then you'd be behind. But I would definitely begin by pitching something. And by pitching something, I think Sharon Marcus taught us that that's all about telling an editor why ordinary non-experts should care about this. Isn't that roughly what we get out of that? And so that means really working with your friends and preferably friends not in the same field. Uh, have a writing group, pitch to them, try to see if people look interested and then go for that. And then if you, over time, you might build up a portfolio, as it were. And then if you also, in your academic work, write well, that could help. But I don't know that there's a, I don't know that there's like one royal road to doing it. I think you really have to want to do it. And particularly as junior faculty, or even as a grad student, I'm not sure you get enough recognition for it in academia. So. Should you spend like I spent two months on this thing, more or less? Uh, is that a good way to spend your two months? That's I think the reward structure in academia isn't always geared up for this. But then on the other hand, as I said, I still think we need to do our scholarship because that's crucial. Um, so no, that's not helping you much. <laughs> but I would say pitch to some journals who are always asking to have pitches. And, and they are out there. Didn't you write for Eon and the, uh, Corinna, Eon and the LA Review of Books? Did you pitch or did they ask you? Yeah, exactly. So you could try that. I mean, particularly if you get, I think the good point to pitch something is you discover something. Maybe it's some, somewhat in your field, and you get really excited about it. That's where you really have to listen to your own responses. They will not publish it just because it must be objectively important. You gotta feel it matters and tell others why. Well, I 
think have we run out no have we run out of time or do you have more time okay okay if we can use them anyone else want to talk about anything Oh, seems like I've exhausted you all. <laughs> so then we'll just call it a day. <laughs>